Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. This is our second seminar in the Intelligent Medical Decision Making Seminar Series. Uh, thank you for joining us to uh, welcome Dr. Shadmer. Dr. Shadmer is a professor of biomedical engineering and neuroscience at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His research focuses on understanding how the human brain perceives the world, how it learns, and how it controls our movements. Dr. Shadmer also serves as co-director of the Biomedical Engineering PhD program at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Gonzaga University. He earned a master's degree in biomedical engineering and a PhD in computer science, robotics, uh, from the University of Southern California. Then Dr. Shadmer completed the McDonald Pew postdoctoral fellowship at MIT and joined the Johns Hopkins faculty in 1995. Uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Shadmer. And Dr. Shadmer, thank you so much for giving us a talk today. And I personally, I am very excited to learn from your talk. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And I thought to spend some time with you describing a puzzle about the brain and how we have gone to try to understand um, that puzzle, how it contributes to control of movements. I'm going to be talking about the cerebellum, and I'm going to highlight the work of uh, four of my students. Um, they are shown here, and they are Ehsan Sedaratnejad, Paul Hage, Jay Pai, and Amin Fakharian. These are um, PhD students uh, in the program. So um, I thought to begin with a uh, description a little bit about the cerebellum and what do we know about its history. Um, Pierre Florence, 200 years ago, began studying the cerebellum and like most neuroscientists back then, they just removed it and they saw what happens. What they saw was that the slightest disturbance altered what he called the harmony of the movements. Um, he compared the animal's reeling gait to that of a drunkard. He said, the will, the senses, the perception remained, the power of movement was retained, but the coordination of movement, the ability for controlled and determined movement was lost. A, about a hundred years later, Ramon Cajal was studying neurons underneath his microscope. And, and he noticed that the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum um, were this beautiful structure that was surrounded by what were called basket cells. And from that raised this beautiful idea called the neuron doctrine, the idea that individual cells make up the fundamental units of computation. So the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum were very critical for coming up with this idea of neurons and neurons being the central unit of computation. Then um, a few years later, Gordon Holmes, he was a physician in, in England and um, uh, there was uh, soldiers returning from World War I and um, he noticed that there was a particular problem. So this is the British helmet and this is the German helmet. And you notice that the German helmet covers the back of the head. British helmet does not. And so a lot of the soldiers that Britain had returned from the war and had this damage to the back of their head. And that had caused cerebellar damage. And so Gordon Holmes was the first neurologist to identify the problems that these soldiers had. And he described two kinds of problems. Postural tone was diminished, but most importantly, the movements were dysmetric. The most obvious errors are, however, seen toward the end of the movement. So what he noticed was that these soldiers, they made movements okay, but then at the end of the movement, there was something wrong. A couple of decades later, David Marr had a very influential computational theory. He saw the cerebellum as a learning machine. He thought that inputs to these cells, Purkinje cells, had weights that were modifiable. And he thought that inferior olive, a region that provides inputs to the cerebellum, was the teacher and the Purkinje cells were the students. This was a theoretical idea that came from David's more uh, study of anatomy. And then Masao Ito was a physiologist who demonstrated that Purkinje cells are inhibitory neurons and the inputs from the inferior olive indeed 
are the teachers that produce parallel fiber synapses. So what we see here is two basic ideas, one associated with the role of the cerebellum in control of movements and the role of the cerebellum in learning of movements. And I'm gonna show you that if we use theoretical ideas about learning, we can make understandings about control of the movement. So let's begin and let's, let's consider a simple paradigm. And in this paradigm, all we wanna do is hold this book steady. So what you see is that if you go to pick up the book yourself, the brain makes predictions about sensory consequences and can precisely turn off the biceps at the right time by the right amount so the arm stays steady. On the other hand, if somebody else picks up the book off your arm, what happens is that you have delay in your sensory feedback and you respond, but you respond late. So what we have is that we have a perturbation to the body, sensory system responds, it responds late, but if you voluntarily move the book yourself, what happens is that you send a copy of these commands to something that in engineering we call a forward model that makes predictions about consequences and that allows you to control your arm. So if you were to make a movement, the idea is that a copy of those commands are sent someplace and that someplace makes some kind of predictions about consequences that allows you to overcome the delay in your sensory feedback. We think the cerebellum has something to do with that. So this is just a theoretical idea from robotics that we need to have these concepts of models that makes predictions about consequences. Now, many years ago, we began looking at control of movements in cerebellar patients, wondering, is there a way to map this concept of forward models to control the movements? And just like Holmes and his study of cerebellar soldiers that had received damage to the back of their head, what we noticed is that there were similar kinds of problems in cerebellar patients. Basically, Here's my student, uh, Maurice. He's holding a, what we call a robotic arm. He's making reaching. So he's making movements to a target like this. Now, if you ask a patient to make those same movements, what you see is that movements roughly begin normally, but then there are these problems at the end of the movement, as you see here. So that, that's called dysmetria. Now, this is not limited to reaching movements. You also see it in their saccades. Let me show you an example. So saccades are the movements that your eye makes when you, for example, reading. It's these rapid movements that takes about 40, 50 milliseconds to conclude. Now, the patient here is asked to make saccades. And let's see what, let's see what happens. So you see how the movement begins, but then instead of ending on the target, it overshoots, and then it overshoots, and then it overshoots, and then finally settles. So what you see is that the movements are not ending well. They start, but they don't end well. So the problem that I want to pose for you today, we want to ask, what does the cerebellum compute that is so essential for ending of that movement? What's this have to do with the concept of forward models? What does it have to do with this ending of the movements? That's the puzzle. Now I'm gonna focus on saccades, saccadic eye movements. And to do that, I need to give you a little bit of background about control of these movements. The basic idea is saccades are done by a circuitry that involves the brainstem and the cerebral cortex. And for the saccade movements, like all other movements, cerebellum is the side loop, the thing that is somehow listening to commands. So let me show you that. Here what we have is a diagram showing you that input from the retina arrives directly to the superior colliculus. This is a brainstem structure. And it has the machinery via the burst generators and the motor neurons to generate what we call saccades. But it's not trusted with making these movements. That retinal input also goes to, of course, the thalamus and eventually reaches the cerebral cortex. And we have the frontal eye field, the parietal cortex, the basal ganglia, what they do is that they evaluate the visual scene. They look at the stimuli that are available and then through inhibitory and excitatory projections to the basal, to the superior colliculus, they activate a region that say, this is the region that I want you to make a movement toward. And then you make a movement. So that movement takes place. A copy of those commands are sent to the cerebellum. Cerebellum makes some kind of prediction. 
And what we saw was that when there's something wrong with the cerebellum, and so you're not getting these predictions, this circuitry here doesn't seem to function properly. We get this dysmetria. Now, many people have worked on this problem, and I've just briefly listed this, their names here. And you, so you can see that for control of eye movements, there are absolute giants that have described how these various structures help make a simple eye movement take place. But the problem still remains, and this is the basic problem. When we measure neural activity in the cerebellum during a saccade, we really have a hard time understanding if it's making a prediction, what is it predicting? That's, that's the problem of neural encoding. And I want to show you what that problem is and how we're going to go about trying to make some advances in understanding this problem. Okay, so what is this problem? So I showed you that when there's damage to the cerebellum, the movements, the saccade starts, but doesn't end on target. So you might expect if you look at the principal cells of the cerebellum called Purkinje cells, you would see something that has resembles the computation associated with ending of the movement, but that's not the case. So here's our subject. This is a marmoset. It's a what's called a new world monkey. They live in the Amazon jungles of South America. So we're gonna record from the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum of this animal in the region that's responsible for making saccades. And so here's the saccade, this is the eye velocity. Saccade is to the left, here's saccade is to the right, and here's the Purkinje cells. First of all, you notice it has baseline firing at about 40 Hertz, and then it suppresses its activity during this movement. Now, Purkinje cells are inhibitory neurons. So what you're seeing is that this case, it's, it's, it's suppressing its activity. It doesn't seem to care particularly of the duration of this movement because you see that the suppression lasts much longer than the movement itself. Here's another cell, it suppresses its activity. Here's one that suppresses its activity. Here's one that bursts. Here's another one that bursts and then pauses. Here's the one that just bursts in both directions and so forth. So what you see is this incredible diversity of activity among the Purkinje cells. We don't see any relationship to direction of movement. They're bursting and pausing, and we certainly don't see anything associated, especially with the end of the movement when we look at individual Purkinje cells. So that's the basic puzzle. How do we understand activity and what is it that the cerebellum is predicting? So to help us understand this problem, I wanna go back to the idea of learning. Now I wanna briefly describe for you what do we know about the anatomy of the circuit. Basically the cerebellum is like a three-layer network. And if you have a three-layer network, what you have is that you have input data that comes to the first layer, then you have this intermediate layer, so-called hidden layer. Finally, you have this output layer. To train this network, what you do is that, well, you compare it, its predictions to observations. And, and indeed, in, this, in the actual cerebellum, things kind of look like this three-layer network. We have lossy fiber input that represents the input, the copy of those commands that the brain is sending to the cerebellum. And then you have the output that comes from the nucleus cells. Purkinje cells are in the middle. So suppose we wanted to train this network. What we would do is that we would want to have every neuron that contributes to making a prediction receive information about the prediction error. So you would compare the prediction with an observation. That would be the difference. And that would become the prediction error. You would want to send this prediction error to every neuron that, that is contributing to making that prediction. In the cerebellum, we see something similar. We have nucleus cells that send their output. They go to a region called the inferior all. And we think the output of the inferior olive is a prediction error, and it's going back to the cerebellum. But what something is really interesting about this circuitry is that the prediction error goes very strongly to these Purkinje cells, the hidden layer, but weakly to the nucleus cells. So the curiosity about the anatomy is that the middle layer neurons, Purkinje cells, receive a very strong error signal from the inferior olive, but the output layer neurons have little or no error information. That's weird. So why? What's going on? It probably has something to do with evolution and the fact that the nucleus cells came on, on board later than the Purkinje cells. But let me just show you the meaning of this, this error information and how it's going to the middle layer, but not to the output layer. Okay, so here was our three-layer network. And I'm going to show you now a recording from the Purkinje cells. So here's our recording, and I'm going to play this movie for you so you can see it and hopefully also hear it.
So what you're seeing is that, first of all, you see these spikes that are downward. Those are the regular spikes that we see every day. The Purkinje cell is sending its information to the nucleus. Then you see these other spikes, and these are called complex spikes. The complex spikes are the feedback that the Purkinje cell is getting from the inferior olive, and we think it's providing error information. So by the fact that these cells have both simple spikes, these are simple spikes, the ones that are just going downward, and complex spikes, we can identify the cell as a Purkinje cell, which is very important because you, you, you know for sure what you're recording from. Now, what you see is that you have input from the inferior olive, this prediction error, having a really fundamental large impact of the, on the Purkinje cells. So the error information is arriving very strongly to the Purkinje cells. On the other hand, when we look at the nucleus neuron, and this is work from Jaeger in 2016, when they optogenetically stimulated the inferior olive, inferior olive, so they provided input to the nucleus cells, they barely see an impact on the nucleus cells. So the idea being the error information goes very strongly to the middle layer, but not the output layer. All right, but we still have this learning problem. We have to have all the cells that are contributing to making predictions learn from error. So how are we going to do this? This is the fundamental idea of population coding. So what we know there is an anatomy is that we have 50 Purkinje cells that project onto a nucleus neuron. So these cells are sort of like the parents of this nucleus neuron. This nucleus neuron is a child. The child is making a prediction. It's getting an observation. The comparison is producing an error. The error information is going to the parents and not the child. So how do we teach the child from the parents? Well, the idea is you want the parents to all get the same error information. If they all got the same error information, then that error information would result in a synchronous complex spike, and then that would identify this as saying, oh, this was an error that arrived. I will then send this information to the nucleus neuron, perhaps allow it to, um, to learn from that error. So the basic idea then in population coding is as follows. To teach both the middle layer and the output layer, the error information should organize the Purkinje cell into populations. And so the error should come and act on a group of Purkinje cells that together project on to the nucleus neuron. Thus, to understand the language of the simple spikes, it will be useful to organize the Purkinje cells into populations that share the same, same, same error, same preference for error. So to understand the simple spikes, we have to organize the Purkinje cells into groups that care about the same error, which is through their complex spikes. So that's the basic fantasy. And if we organize things into groups that share the same preference for error, then their predictions might make sense. Okay, so we're gonna now organize Purkinje cells based on preference for error. Now, before I do that, I need to tell you a little bit about what is this error that I'm talking about. So we're gonna be talking about saccades. Saccades are eye movements that you make. The sensory consequence of saccades are visual information on your retina that then becomes activity on the superior colliculus. So let's, let's go through this briefly so we can understand what do we mean by error. Suppose you are asked to look at the dot on the screen and we are recording from your superior colliculus. Now we know that the left part of the superior colliculus is going to care about the stimuli on the right side of your fovea. So when you're looking at the screen, at this dot here, what happens is that there's activity in this region of the colliculus, the region that represents the fovea. So that activity is high, you are looking at that part of the screen. Now, when I show you a target to the right, as you see here, what happens is that there's activity that rises in a region that's associated with the right part of the screen, which happens in this case to be on the left part of your colliculus. So for you to make a saccade, the rest of the brain, the basal ganglia and the frontal eye field, what happens is that they increase the activity here, they decrease the activity here, you make a saccade. You move your eye to this location. Now, when your eye arrives there, the expected sensory consequence of that movement is that the target should be on the fovea. So you expect the activity to be here. But if I've moved the target to here, 
that's an error because the activity appears in this part of the colliculus. So this is the expected sensory consequences. This is the actual sensory consequences. The two are different. That's an error. It activates the inferior olive. You get complex spikes in a group of Purkinje cells. So, so we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to understand now what part of the visual space as mapped on the colliculus is going to this group of Purkinje cells. So effectively, we're mapping the visual space through the colliculus onto the Purkinje cells. We're going to find the Purkinje cells that care about the same part of the error space and then put them together and ask, what are they predicting together as a population? Okay, so our first step is we want to understand how the Purkinje cell, an individual cell, responds to error, understand its tuning function. So here's our subject. She's looking at this fixation point. I present a target. She makes a saccade, but at the end of the saccade, the target is not on the fovea, it's someplace else. And by doing this, we're mapping this error space onto the Purkinje cell. And here's what happens. So the Purkinje cells have two kinds of spikes. Remember, they have those rapidly firing simple spikes. Those are blue that you see here. And then occasionally this error comes. That's this red, the complex spikes. And you see that when the error is to the left of the fovea, this cell gives you a good number of complex spikes. If the error is to the right, it doesn't give you as many complex spikes. So you simply look at the probability of complex spikes when the error occurs, you map it and you say, all right, here's the preferred error of this Purkinje cell. And what we can see is that this Purkinje cell prefers leftward errors. And so here's the time course of that cell response. So when it's in direction CS on, the preferred error direction, we call it CS on. And when it's in the opposite direction, we call it CS plus one A. So we're beginning now to form a coordinate system of error associated with each Purkinje cell. Now, step two, we're gonna use this coordinate system to define a new coordinate system for control of movements. So we're gonna use preferred error to define this coordinate system. So we record from a bunch of Purkinje cells. In this case, they're on the right part of cerebellum vermis. Some prefer upward error, some prefer leftward error, some prefer leftward down errors, and so forth. Here's a distribution. Now, what we're going to do is as follows. For every Purkinje cell, we're going to look at its preferred error, CS on, to define a new coordinate system. So suppose this is the preferred error of a Purkinje cell. So it prefers errors to direction, as you see. Now, suppose you make a saccade. This is the saccade that you make. Now, we would call this saccade a 45 degree saccade because arbitrarily we've chosen this to be zero and this to be 90. But now what we're gonna do, we're gonna rotate our coordinate system so that zero becomes the preferred error. In that case, this is not a 45 degree saccade. This is a CS plus 250 saccade. So the movement now is with respect to the preferred error of this Purkinje cell. Why are we doing this? Because we wanna map the error space onto the cerebellum then organize the cells based on their preference for error. By doing so, we hope that this fantasy that we have regarding the coordinate system of representation, we will make sense of the predictions that the cerebellum is making. Okay, so here was our problem. The animal makes a saccade, some cells burst, some cells pause, some cells do other things. There's nothing special about the end of the movement in any single Purkinje cell. But now we define a new coordinate system organize them based on the similar preference for error. And what do we see? What we see is that when this animal makes a saccade in direction CS plus 180, there are some cells that burst, some cells that pause, but together as a simple addition of their spikes, you see something remarkable. You see a burst followed by a pause and the activity ends when the movement ends. So now you see that by organizing the cells based on their preference for error, you see an ability to make sense of their spikes. They are making predictions about potentially when the movement should end. In other directions, you see that this encoding wanes. So in CS plus 90, you see that there is a burst fire by a pause, but the pause is weaker and so forth. So it appears that there is an encoding of the movement in the simple spike of the population, but not individual cells. So here's when the movement is in direction CS plus 180 for small amplitude, low velocity movements, you see a burst by a pause, 
you see a burst by a pause when the movement becomes longer, when the movement becomes longer. In all cases, you see that the activity is becoming a pause around the time when you're supposed to decelerate. Now remember, Purkinje cells are inhibitory neurons. So what they're doing is that they are increasing their inhibition, then they're releasing their inhibition right around the time when you're supposed to stop the movement. The burst grows with the velocity, the pause is time locked to onset of deceleration. So it looks like the Purkinje cells as a population are predicting when the movement should be stopped. Okay, let me summarize briefly where we are. We had this puzzle of what the heck are these simple spikes making predictions? How are they related to control of movements and that dysmetria? What we did is that we, we recognize the cerebellum is a three layer network. Error information should be conveyed to all the cells, but it seems like it's going very strongly to the middle layer, not the output layer. We imagine that the inferior olive, the location where the error was computed, was like a city architect, was organizing the Purkinje cell, the parents, if you will, into anatomical neighborhoods, producing populations that had a common preference for error. So error is not sent everywhere. It's sent to special regions where Purkinje cells care about just that error. And when we organize the Purkinje cells based on this idea, what we found was that their simple spikes appear to predict features of the oncoating saccade, particularly timing of deceleration. Okay, so Purkinje cells are inhibitory neurons. I just showed you that they make predictions based on some aspect of their deceleration of the movement. So they project onto this nucleus neuron, and their objective is to now, through the prediction, make this nucleus neuron do something. But, but remember, all, the, all they have is inhibition. So if they want the nucleus neuron to do something, what they can do is, first of all, change the firing rate. So I just showed you that. So they can burst, and then they can pause, and through this pause, perhaps they can get the nucleus neuron to fire. But there's something more interesting that they can do, which is they can synchronize their spikes within a population. So they can send their simple spikes not on average so that the firing rate falls, but that they can they could place their spikes that are precisely aligned in time. And let me show you that if they do that, then despite the fact that they're inhibitory neurons, they can get the nucleus neuron to fire. And this comes from the work of Abby Person and Indira Raman, um, who described this concept, and I want to describe it for you as well. So the idea is that if the Purkinje cells can synchronize their spikes, they can get the nucleus neuron to fire, even though these are inhibitory neurons. Okay, so what Abby and Indira did is that they recorded in slice in, of mice, uh, Purkinje cells that were connected to a single nucleus neuron. And what they showed was that if these eight Purkinje cells that they had recorded from, each fired on average at 50 hertz, but the spikes were not synchronized, then this nucleus neuron would just inhibit just one barrage of inhibition that they were getting. But something interesting happened if they synchronize the spikes of that inhibition. So again, the same eight Purkinje cells, each firing at an average rate of 50 hertz, but let's now make those spikes that appear, half of them synchronized. And what they saw was that when those events happened, then there was this high probability that afterwards the nucleus neuron fired. So this suggested that in principle, if the Purkinje cells could synchronize their spikes, they could get the nucleus neuron to fire. Now, does this actually happen in real life? Well, real life meaning in the alive animal when they're making movements. Now, one of the advantages of the marmoset and the reason why we study them is because they're primates, which means they make saccades, but also they're small, which means that we can use the tools that have been developed for rodents to study the brain of primates. Now, we need saccades as a, as a way to look at this question, to question of synchrony, because if you want to measure a statistical phenomenon like synchrony, you need a ton of data. And saccades are nice because, you know, animals make two saccades per second. Okay, so that gives us lots of data. So here was our average firing rate of the population. And now what we're going to do is measure the synchrony. And what you see, is that despite the fact that firing rates increase, there's no change in synchrony. But when there is suppression, then you see this increase in synchrony. And that synchrony is wanes when the suppression goes away.
So synchronization is greatest during deceleration of these specific saccades that had suppression in their activity. So putting the story together, asking the question, when P cells share a common preference for error, what we see is that their firing rate falls below baseline, but then they also synchronize their spikes during deceleration. Thus, by both reducing their inhibition and synchronizing their spikes, they may be able to drive the nuclear output precisely during deceleration when you need to stop the movement. Okay, now what I showed you was that there is a burst, there's a pause, the pause has spikes that are synchronized, that might have something to do with stopping the movement. But I showed you only that for a single direction, when it was in opposite direction to the preferred error. Can we show a relationship between that activity and the motor output? Can you show me that that disinhibition that takes place is actually relevant to stopping the movement? Now, the problem is Purkinje cells, are, they're far away from the motor neurons, right? So they're sitting in the cerebellum and they're many synapses away from how they might actually affect behavior. But in principle, I'm gonna show you a way that we can link their spikes with changes in behavior. Let me give you a little bit of background about this. So here's the data that I showed you. On average, their activity rises and then it declines right around the time of deceleration. And I showed you the synchronization that seemed to increase around the time of deceleration. Now, what I've done is that I've organized these Purkinje cells based on their preferred error. I said they cared about this error to the bottom right, and let's put together all the neurons that care about that error. Now, these neurons, in my fantasy, they project onto this deep nucleus neuron. And the question is, where does this deep nucleus neuron go? How does that affect behavior? There's work in our literature in, from Ekerot 95 to a couple of works that demonstrates that there may be consistency between a Purkinje cell's response to error and the direction of the action of the nucleus neuron it projects to, meaning that if it prefers errors like this, it's gonna go to a nucleus neuron that eventually reaches some motor neuron someplace that produces an action that is corresponding to the error. So if you prefer this error, you're gonna act on behavior in such a way that responds to that specific error. It's kind of like a fancy reflex system that it can adapt. Now, the question is, when we see this activity in these Purkinje cells, when they're suppressing their activity, this should result, we think, in nucleus activity that produces a force that will stop this movement, which means that there should be a relationship between the suppression of activity in the simple spikes and the downstream change in behavior. It should be in the opposite direction as the um, preferred error. So let's see if that's true. How are we going to how are we going to ask this possibility? So when I showed you the complex spikes and the simple spikes, what I didn't tell you is that when a complex spike occurs, it's such a potent input to the Purkinje cell that it causes suppression of the simple spikes. So it's like the, the small natural perturbation to the computations that are taking place. Let me show you that in this data. This is work from my student Solomon Mule. So what Solomon did is that he is plotting for you in every line that you see here, a trial where we recorded from this particular simple spike. So you see that, that this particular Purkinje cell. So what you see is that here's when the saccade starts. And you see that this cell is increasing its simple spikes many times when the saccade takes place. And you see these red dots here? That's when the complex spikes occur. So you see that for many, many trials, there are no complex spikes. Then occasionally you see these complex spikes here. But what he's done now is to sort the data based on the timing of the complex spike. And what you very clearly see is after the complex spike, there's a short period when there are no simple spikes. Then sometimes complex spikes occur during the saccade. Okay, so when a complex spike occurs during the saccade, that means that the simple spikes are suppressed. So this Purkinje cell can't send its computation. This is beautiful setup for us because it says, look, you just disrupted naturally the activity of a single Purkinje cell. How does that affect your behavior? The hypothesis is that there should be a relationship between the preferred error of that Purkinje cell and the suppression that took place in the simple spikes and how it influences downstream motor structure. 
it will be instructing something to the motor structures because I just suppressed my activity. What is this instruction that's being sent? And this is just a single Purkinje cell now, remember, at least the ones that we're recording from. And remarkably, I'm going to show you that we're going to be able to see the influence of that cell. Okay, so here's the activity of this Purkinje cells, all of this population, when there is no complex spike. When there is a complex spike during this period, obviously it disrupts the simple spikes. Okay, what does this do to behavior? Now, we have a coordinate system, right? We have the direction of preferred error, CS on, and we can imagine CS plus 90. So that's an orthogonal coordinate system. We can project our saccades to this coordinate system and ask what's the difference between a trial when there was no complex spike and one when there was a complex spike. And remarkable, what we see is that the eye gets pushed in direction CS on when there is a single complex spike in a Purkinje cell. And the effect is just absolutely tiny. So you see it's six degrees per second. A saccade is 600 degrees per second, two orders of magnitude smaller. How is it possible that we can see this effect? It's because you're recording tens of thousands of saccades. And through that averaging, you can see the influence of a single spike. And what we see is that it pushes the eye in direction CSO. So suppression of the simple spikes leads to force production in direction CSO. Let's go back to what we had. Okay, we imagine that these cells were all organized based on preferred error that we call CSO. And now what I've shown you is that the effect of suppression of their simple spikes is to push the eye in direction CSO. So this was a saccade in direction CS plus 180. You see suppression. The suppression, according to this, is going to produce force in direction CS on. That's opposite to the direction of movement. That's how you stop. So we have now a mechanism to see that, all right, this suppression coinciding with this synchrony is producing an event that's saying, stop my movement, it's sending a command that says produce force in direction CS on, which is opposite to the direction of the saccade. Therefore, we think that's how the movement stops. Okay, the final thing that I want to describe for you. How does the cerebellum know when to stop the movement? So how does it compute this, this important parameter that says now is the time that this movement should be stopped? Where does this information come from? What does this have to do with those forward models that I was showing you at the beginning of this talk? How is this relationship with that? Okay. So the fundamental question now is what is being computed? What is this nature of this computation that's being performed? So what we have is that we have this three layer network and what we wanna know is that what, what is, what's the output of these Purkinje cells, what's being computed to it? And of course, to understand the computation, you have to ask what's the input to the circuitry? So we need to understand the input. And then I just showed you that through this population coding, we can understand the output. And by then looking at this input-output relationship, maybe we can guess what's the total computation of the circuitry, how this um, prediction about when to end the movement is coming about. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? So in order to do this, we need to understand the input as well as the output. All right, how do we get the input? So let me show you an MRI of the marmoset cerebellum. And if you look closely, you can see that there are three layers here. Those are the three layers I've been showing you. This is called the molecular layer, the top layer, then the Purkinje layer, then the granule layer. And then you notice that it folds under and then it folds again. So that's the beautiful structure, the way it is folding. Now, when you insert an electrode into the brain, what this means is that these contacts up here are going to get the molecular layer, then the Purkinje layer, then the granule layer, then because of that folding, granule layer, Purkinje layer, molecular layer. Let me show you an example of this. So that folding is going to give you the molecular layer. That's where the dendrites of the Purkinje cell are. Here's the Purkinje layer. That's where the cell body is. And then the axon is what's called the granule layer. These neurons and these various structures. And so when we insert one of these linear probes, you know, you can see these neurons in the dendritic tree, and then you can see the Purkinje cells, and then you see these neurons in the granule layer. And what they allow us to do is 
get multiple views of a single spike. So that each contact is like a little antenna that's picking that when a spike takes place, how it is influencing the dendritic tree, the Purkinje layer, and the granules. So these are the, those are the simple spikes. And those simple spikes around the soma have this downward shape, that's upward shape in the dendrites and so forth. So you get this, this like a video of a spike as it takes place in the entire cell body of a Purkinje cell. And what we can also see are the complex spikes. And what this allows us to tell is that where is the dendrite, where is the soma, where is the cell body? And that's critical because the dendrites are describing the molecular layer. The Purkinje cell layer is here where the spikes have this shape. And then finally, the granule layer. Now, the granule layer is important because that's where the input to the cerebellum comes from. It's called the mossy fibers. And it turns out that those mossy fibers have a special shape to their spikes. They have this M-shaped spike waveform that has this negative afterward. So by using the shape of the spikes, we can identify just as well as we could the complex spike, what, are, what, what is the input to the circuitry, which is the mossy fibers. And so here's another example of the mossy fibers input to the circuitry. Okay. This is as a way of background to suggest to you that these modern probes allow us to fairly successfully, fairly definitively identify this input, mossy fibers. Okay, so what do we see? So mossy fibers, I will show you, seem to have a representation of that visual map on the colliculus, as well as the motor commands that are being generated to make the movement. So some of the mossy fibers look like this. So here's a saccade. And for example, when the saccade is the top left, you see that this, this mossy fiber has large activity, hundreds of spikes per second, um, but it has a particular part of the visual space that it cares about. It doesn't just care about all saccades that are made in one direction. It has this tuning that's specific to a particular location. That's like what you would expect for inputs that come from the superior colliculus. It tells you where is the goal of my movement. About half the cells look like this. Another half look like this. This cell also cares about leftward movements, but now you notice that it has a, a, a representation that doesn't have a specific location in mind, but it looks more like muscles. It looks like the activity that you are producing in order to make that movement. It has this broad field representation. So about another half look like this, and a tiny portion have this pausing activity that looks like the uh, uh, potentially the rostral pole, the region where it shuts off when you make a saccade, sort of fixation zone uh, around the fovea of the colliculus. So we have some cells that care about the goal of the movement, some cells that care about the motor commands that are generated to produce that movement, and finally some cells that just pause during them. So let me put this together for you as a simple computational model. Suppose that the input to the cerebellum, the mossy fibers, represent these two broad classes. The desired displacement, here it is. Here's where I'm trying to go. That's where the visual input was. And then here are the motor commands that I'm going to generate to get you there. Suppose you have these two pieces of information. The motor commands are like a velocity representation. So what you would need to do, you would need to integrate that command, meaning add up the spikes that you're getting in time, and if you did that, you would get an estimate of the displacement that is taking place in real time. This is the desired displacement. This is the estimated displacement. Now look what I've done here. I've taken a motor command and I made a sensory prediction. That's a forward model. And I've done it through integration, adding up the, the motor commands. So if I had a desired displacement and I had a desired, sorry, if I had a desired displacement and I had an estimated displacement, and if I compare these two, as long as I haven't reached my desired displacement, I should keep going. Once I reach this boundary that's set by the desired displacement, then I should stop the movement. Look at what I've been showing you with regard to the Purkinje cells. I've been showing you an integration, add up, add up, add up. Did I reach what I'm trying to go to? If I did, shut off the Purkinje cell. So that's what I think is the computation that's taking place. It's a form of integration of a forward model computing where am I with respect to where I'm supposed to go 
when I reach it, shut off the Purkinje cell. By doing so, you disinhibit the nucleus neuron, you produce forces that oppose the movement, you then stop it. Okay, so that's the basic fantasy how I think the cerebellum is working. Now, there are many problems with this presentation. Let me describe some of the problems for you. First, if, if it's really the case that the cerebellar cortex is performing this concept of integration to bound, we need experiments that actually show how these neurons are doing this, so how the molecular layer neurons and the granular layer neurons are really performing this integration that might take place. And we need to do it simultaneously with the Purkinje cells and ask, is this really the computation that's taking place? I don't know. We haven't done that. The second issue is that um, I've been telling you the predictions in terms of the simple spikes and synchronization. And learning traditionally in the cerebellum is viewed as the error causing synaptic plasticity called LTD. But if the predictions are both in terms of their activity and their synchronization, then what this suggests is that learning has to change not just the average firing, but the precise timing of when the Purkinje cells fire, which means synchronization. We have no learning rule that alters synchronization. All we have are learning rules that change average firing rates. So potentially there's a new learning rule to be discovered how the cerebellum synchronizes spikes based on errors. Finally, the major problem with what I've been showing you is that I've been talking about Purkinje cells, but remember Purkinje cells are the middle layer. They're not the output of the cerebellum. I haven't shown you what's going on in the nucleus, and the reason for it is because we don't know. We can't understand that. We don't know the language of the nucleus neurons at this point, so we need to figure that out. That remains to be done. Okay, let me finish. So population coding, I think, in the cerebellum may be organized based on clustering of Purkinje cells that have a common preference for error. If we fantasize this and actually organize the Purkinje cells based on this error tuning, what we found was that the simple spikes of the population seem to suppress the activity during deceleration of the movement and synchronize their spikes during that time. And we think that that leads to um, downstream motor commands that will stop the movement. And we think that the basic computation that's performed here is something like a forward model that integrates motor commands to make predictions about the estimated sensory consequences, compares that to the desired goal of the movement. If that goal is reached, then stops the movement. Okay, so I study movements and um, in Persian literature, there is no better poet than Hafez and he describes movements much more eloquently and I could. So Hafez is a 14th century Persian poet, and here's what he says. Because of our wisdom, we will travel far for love, as all movement is a sign of thirst, and speaking really says, I'm hungry to know. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Shatner. Excellent, okay. excellent talk. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. I personally learned a lot and I'm excited about what I learned, what I just learned in the last 15 minutes, 50 minutes. Uh, so any questions from the audience, can you please raise your hand? But meanwhile, I, I'm going to ask uh, the first question. So you 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 just did a very uh, nice job just giving us a talk about the clustering of the pixels and organizing them in, uh, you know, based on their performance for error. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, also you gave us an example of, about the book, holding the book, uh, you know, in in a uh, you know certain position. Also. Last week in the news, I saw an article. I just read read it very briefly. It it was about the soccer players that in a soccer match, those ones that they are aware of a ball that is hitting their head, 
they get less injured than those ones that their head gets hit by a ball and they were not aware. So can, can you uh, interpret that for us based on what you say? Is it possible to just relate it to what you uh, discussed today? Sure. Um, I haven't read that article, so I don't know. But I'll take a guess. The idea is that uh, perturbations are um, things that cause disruptions in our in our body and through biomechanics can have a tremendous impact. And I think if we could predict the event, then we can brace ourselves and we can respond to it in a, in a way that might minimize the effect that they have. And I suspect that in that case, um, the injuries might be lessened if there is the ability to foresee that um, an event is coming and therefore through prediction, try to ameliorate some of the negative consequences. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Please, uh, please mute yourself and ask, introduce yourself and ask your questions if there are questions from Dr. Shotman. And let me ask you one, one more question. Uh, so uh, it's, it's most likely my, uh, my issue in just uh, connecting all of these uh, together. It, it's not, uh, frankly, it, it's not a, an area of my research. Uh, so uh, for the example that you gave at the beginning, again, the, the book example that you gave, but also uh, the pathological conditions for the saccades that you showed some patients that they couldn't control the movement at the end of the uh, cycle. So, or the other experiment that you showed from your student back in 2004, I believe with the robotic uh, arm. Uh, what happened, what, what happens that at the end of the movement, we, we get those uh, different, you know, behavior yeah. patterns, behaviors. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So in our model, what we have is that we have the cerebellum receiving information about the goal of the movement. Where am I supposed to go? Displacement. The motor commands that are being generated. And if you could use a forward model to predict the consequence of those motor commands, it would say that this is how far I've gone. This is how far you want me to go. If I could compare the two, then I could make predictions that you've reached it now, stop. So um, what, what happens in cerebellar disease is that this, this system breaks down. So this integrator breaks down. It does no longer have the ability to make accurate predictions about the sensory consequences. I can't tell you how far I've gone by listening to the motor commands. I have to rely on the sensory feedback. And when the sensory feedback comes, it's delayed. It's too late. And so I overshoot the target and I have to correct. Great. Thank you so much. And it seems that uh, we, we don't have uh, questions from the audience. I, I, once again, I want to thank you for your great talk today. Uh, and uh, it was an excellent experience for me personally. Uh, for our audience, we, we will have Dr. Parisa Rashidi from uh, University of Florida next uh, month in October. Uh, and she is going to give us a talk on intelligent critical care opportunities and challenges. Uh, we will be happy to see you all uh, then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shadmeh. I really appreciate it. Thank bye you for bye. your time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good day.